now we're recording. Welcome. We're, this uh, webinar is a download of what we got out of the DevLearn conference, which was took place this November. It was really fun, packed full of good stuff, good information. Um, sponsored by the eLearning Guild. Let's learn a little bit about DevLearn. So, give you a little background. Where's my arrows down here? Come on. There it is. A lot of us attended. There was actually another student from cohort nine um, that I met walking around the conference. But this is the crew that attended from uh, our current uh, group, our alumni association, um, some of our recent contacts, and of course, some of our presenters here today have, have agreed to share what they learned. So that's awesome. So what is DevLearn? DevLearn is sponsored by the eLearning Guild. They describe themselves uh, themselves as the oldest and most trusted sort of source of information, networking, and community for eLearning professionals. They want to create a place where eLearning professionals can share knowledge, expertise, and ideas to build a better industry, better learning experiences for everyone. And DevLearn sessions are designed for novice to experts. So that was really great because every one of us could find something we could learn from and take back to what we do every day. It's for developers, project managers, managers, directors, um, instructors, actual um, ideas, anybody, students, everybody can learn from this. The thing this year was sparking creativity. So that was really fun. It was a fun uh, a theme to go to the first DevLearn for. So their uh, advertisement said to inspire you to tap into your creativity, take advantage of what technology makes possible for learning today and tomorrow. And they passed out all kinds of uh, fun swag that's actually the best part of the conference. One of them was a coloring book, the DevLearn coloring book that reflects that theme of creativity. the courage to let go of certainties. So the presenters, they had um, Penn Gillette, who talked a little bit about magic. They had someone from Pixar who talked about art. Um, it was really fun. So they, their theme was creativity, the heart of innovation, which is where we're going in e-learning and e-learning design, moving forward to adapt to our learners, right? And what industry needs. It enables us to harness the possibilities posed by new technologies and produce inventive learning and performance solutions. Creativity can make the difference between a cookie cutter e-learning and unique and beneficial learning programs. So there's the um, e-learning guild website there. One of the sessions were was keynotes as I mentioned. Um, this was something I think that was only unique to this DevLearn um, conference and it was having an artist there who took notes for us and these posters were presented in the um, expo hall and you could go up to them and see what things did this person who was doing the artwork pull out of the session and they're really nice little snapshots of what was presented so I thought I'm gonna put those in this presentation and when we send it to you you'll be able to expand them and, and study them at length but this is a gentleman from Pixar and he talked about how would they spur their people to be more creative. I got a chance to tour Pixar once and it was really fun to see they purchase sheds from Home Depot. Every uh, creative talent person gets a shed and they can decorate it however they want. One guy had a Las Vegas gambling theme, another person had Chinese lanterns and, and all kinds of Chinese artwork up and whatever they want. And they have a lot of um, perks like uh, free food, place a gym, those kind of things, because they said we want our people to play as hard as they work. So it was, it was really fun to listen to them. Oh, and he did talk about geometry quite a bit. I love that presentation because it showed how much math is required to do animation. So here are just some of the illustrated um, creativity themes that were presented. Simple e-learning success was one of them. Um, using virtual reality. So this was a session. I don't know how they chose which sessions to illustrate, but they're um, really detailed and they really have some great notes here. I'm losing my little arrow down here. It disappeared. Okay. Um, performance support. Kind of look at that one. Creating media, creating and compressing media everywhere. 
And one of the highlights is a thing called Demo Fest. And is Beth on yet? I'm here. Oh, uh, you were going to talk a little bit about Demo Fest. Uh, no, actually, I'm talking about Captivate. Oh, you're going to talk about Captivate. Okay. Yeah. Um, you shared something about Demo Fest when we discussed it that I thought was really interesting. You said it was a chance, I believe this is the way you put it, it was a chance for businesses to share what they're doing. Right. right, right. And you can, um, they actually, I got an email from them and you can submit uh, what you do and you can actually present there. So it's a thought that maybe you guys want to do next year. So rather than just the, you know, the usual type presentation, what you get is, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to bump that. You get um, a table a very small table, like a cocktail table and chairs. You can kind of see that in this picture here. And um, you can present however you wish. You could have a computer, you could have, um, this woman was presenting from a library where she had tags that the students come, you know, from local schools, they get tags and the tags will um, trigger explanations at different um, exhibits as the students go through it and they can interact then with the exhibits and at the end of the present uh, their their day at the museum the teachers will get a download of everything the student did and all the things that they interacted with so that was pretty cool using API uh, X API and um, there was just demos of all kinds of stuff but here's a little uh, illustration of what demo fest is and at the end the people who are attending us we get to vote through Twitter what we think is a great de demonstration, uh, what we learned the most from, whatever it is, and then they give awards. So getting an award at Demo Fest is really um, a big thing and people really buy hard for those things. But they're very small, quick demonstrations. They give you wine and, and uh, snacks to go through. Um, I think there must have been 100 people. What do you think, Beth? Yeah, I'd say at least 100 people. At least 100 demonstrations. So it's a lot, and it's an hour and a half, so you have to go through pretty quick. But you can pick you know, something that you're interested in, sit down at the table, get in the small group, and learn about it. It was really fun. So Demo Fest was one of the highlights. So some of the sessions, after we were done, we thought, what can we do with all this stuff? We, we should come back and share it with you. There was so much good, good stuff. We went out to dinner every night and talked about what we learned and what are some of the challenges um, facing our field. And so we put this presentation together for you so that you can get a little taste of what we got out of DevLearn. One of the sessions I attended was um, Copyright Trends by Barbara Waxer. I'm always interested in copyright and um, uh, intellectual property and making sure that we're um, using things that we pull off the web appropriately. And I like this slide. I'm not going to give you the whole presentation. But just the Somebody's got a speaker on. That's me. Okay. <laughs> some of the myths are that you can use it just because I can right click and it's mine. I'm an instructional designer. I'm an educator. That's a big one. I'm using this to teach so therefore I can use it. I can remove it if I get caught. I'll, I'll promise to give credit. I'll alter it more than X percent. Oh, there's no copyright symbol, it's mine. If I don't profit from the use, I don't need permission and nobody will come after little old me. Well, that's not really true. And she gave us this little um, thing on a bookmark actually, it was kind of cool. So I thought I would present it for, for you guys. You can take it and use your, the little flow chart here and it'll tell you in the future if you ever wonder, can I use this? Well. Just go through the flow chart and it'll tell you yes or no. Is it in the public domain? She gave us some websites. I'm going to show those to you at the end. Um, if it's in public domain, it's you can use it. Um, is it open access? Are some of the rights reserved or are all of the rights reserved? And then you can go through use it or not use it. So I thought that was kind of nice. Save yourself a lot of money. Um, she said the fair use is something that we deal with again in education quite a bit. I know not all of you are educators, but if you're even in business, you have to think about it. What are the rules for fair use? Often we think, well, if I'm not making a profit from it, it's I can just use it at, at random and that's not true. She said they think if a lawsuit does come down and it does sometimes and it's very expensive. The character, the purpose and character of the use, was it for commercial, education, or nonprofit? How much of it do you did you use? Um, what is the nature of your work? What is the effect of your work? All those things would be coming up at, at part of a court case if you were caught using something you shouldn't have. But then she talked about Creative Commons licenses. If you haven't heard of those, this is a nice little cheat sheet that you can use to go through. And um, finally, she says, when we share, everyone wins. Creative Commons is a way for us to take our work and put it up for 
anyone to use, or we can choose to um, limit some of that use. For example, you can say attribution. Um, Lindsay gives a whole uh, a whole uh, presentation on this. I'm not going to go into it in detail, but uh, creative. Right, Lindsay, you have something on the library page that talks about Creative Commons. Yeah, I've got a, a YouTube playlist and yeah, a variety of tutorials. And I do a lot of this work at the okay. library. So I would suggest that you, if you really are interested in this, look into it in detail. But there are ways that you can take your work and then highlight, you know, with a CC or with this CC and then these little figures here, they're, they're available now. So they're easy to plug into whatever you've created and then someone will see those and know that you have um, given your product this license or this um, capability to be used or not used. And it also lets you recognize what you can use and what you can't use. And then she gives you the no, if it says don't do this, don't do it. So just a nice little guideline. And then she gave all these websites, which I really like. And again, we're gonna make this available to you so you can get online and um, take these just they're all free she says she gave us a couple other websites that we could use federal websites that have um, free images that kind of thing so um, it's nice to have that and she was a lot of the presenters were very willing to share everything they had which I really liked so then barbarawexer.com also that's a place you can go and just mine all of her information she again was very willing to share and we met her again at demo fest and she reiterated anything i have up there you can you can take you can use go for it um i attended another session i'm not going to be the only speaker today so don't worry somebody else will be talking later but this i thought this was a good session to look into because um the issue of diversity, of course, comes up quite a bit. How, who are we teaching? What does our corporation look like? What does our audience look like? And, and is what we're presenting, does that reflect that audience? It's speaking to them. So Tamara Kravitz from John Hopkins presented a session on this. And she started with these pictures. And she had several of them. But um, this one was, what's wrong with this picture? And um, can anybody, if you have your microphone, you can chime in. But what do you see wrong with this picture right off? Anybody have a guess? I'd say um, the. All the not cool kids are not white. Yeah. That oh, was except the one. There's one over there. Okay. Interesting, huh? Yeah. <laughs> All the good examples are white. All the non-examples are not. So, oops. And she said this was put out by the Red Cross, who got slammed afterwards by um, everybody who used the product and said, you know, that is totally uncool they were snapped back and said oops we did not realize that we apologize so sometimes it's done unconsciously and um so the warning to us is think first don't have somebody write to you and say boy you know what you did was so biased and so obviously biased think about it first so then they showed us she showed us um other um examples of some ways that misogyny is displayed um diversity is not displayed in a picture such as the one before that or they're subtly showing um, things that you don't really want them to for example here's a new employee uh, someone wrote to them afterwards and said I'm a new employee and I looked at this and said the initiator is obviously a woman and so that's the one down position and the prover is obviously a man a white male with a the beard here and so what is that telling me that you know here's this imbalance of power so even though you might think that's an innocent picture and those are some things I pulled and it looked great and I thought it was fine and even might even reflect in your actual workplace you have to think about how it's being seen by the people who are using it so then she uh, put up this little chart which I thought was kind of nice um, have you scrutinized all of your images for diversity for age race disability religion and sex and um, look at the diverse skin tones. Why am I making the image selections based on gender over other characteristics if I do choose to do it that way? And is the image equitable? So just some ways to think about your images before you post them. Um, another session I attended was Community to Practice, the Cornerstone of Social Learning. This uh, girl, Jane Bozarth, was talking about her dissertation. Um, 
and I, th I picked up on this one because this was one of the cornerstones of the IDT program, Communities of Practice. It's something that if you've been through our program, you know that we try to develop, try to foster, nurture as you go along. And um, it, a community practice is a group who shares a passion for something that they want to learn, and they want to learn how to do it better. And her basic point was that collective learning and social learning is more effective than that top-down learning. Of course, we know that, correct? And she said, basically, they talked about in her business how they created groups of people teaching each other, talking about um, how the administrators or the managers developed group meaning, group community, group identity, and group learning, and then how you can step away from it as a manager and foster those things. And, um, and then check in every once in a while and make sure that your community of practice is working on meaning. Are they developing as a community? It, is each person's identity being reflected in what's being done? And are they learning together? So those are things that you may not know, but your IDT faculty look at as we watch your communities form. So um, her basic premise was that there are long-term and short-term values for an organization. And so it's a good thing to consider communities of practice, something to um, stop with top-down development and instead have um, more of that bottom-up, let the group learn. So this was uh, just a, a quickie. Again, I'm, I'm going through these pretty quickly because we have other people that are going to speak. But I'm assuming you're going to get a chance to take these later, look at them, expand them, and then you can read them at length and, and kind of pull out some more other than what I'm just sharing now. So Jane Bozarth also left us with a whole lot of resources, and you are free to use those. And the last session, I well, the last one I'm actually going to present today was by Art Cohn. Very short session. Um, he had one theme, and it is that after training, what you do is important, not during training. He said 99% of what we present is going to be lost. It's what you do after that makes a difference. And the way he does that is through boosts. He calls them memory boosts. And what is a memory boost? It's a 30-second quiz sent to a cell phone every day for the first week. So after this session, every day for the first week, we got an email from uh, a little burst from him on our email. And um, it was a little quiz and we had to choose, you know, um, do you remember what happened in whatever? What did we say about the percentage of memory that's lost after a presentation? What is it? Click 90%. And if you don't get it correct, then you get uh, feedback. So I asked him, you know, what program are you using? He told me what it was, but it's something that um, you have to buy. So really, I was thinking Poll Everywhere, some other programs might be able to be used for the same purpose. But it's a, it's a kind of a follow-up. We're not going to do that for you. But um, he summarized it as 120 hours of training needs 18 minutes of boosts. So that's a lot of work, but it might work if you're really trying to get um, your uh, learners, your um, people you're managing to remember what you've taught them. And we, I always go back to the things that we have to do at Cal State Fullerton, the sexual harassment training, the safety training, all those trainings. It's a one-time shot. You do it, you're done, and then you get your, your credit for it. But there's no boost to get it to get into long-term memory. So what he was telling us was that if you hear it once, it's not enough. You have to hear it again and again and again, but not just hear it, use it. Take it and say, how is this going to be applied to what I do every day? So then it made sense. And because he was boosting us for the entire week and then once a week after that and giving us resources that we could use, it really did get into long-term memory, even though his session didn't have much. It, this was it. He did a whole hour on just this one little idea, but it lasted because he did boosts. So I thought that was a kind of an interesting idea. Um, okay, I'm done talking. I just wanted to share one of the last sessions I went to was BYOL, Bring Your Own Laptop. It was done by Joe Ganchi, and I filmed it on my iPad, not the greatest uh, filming in the world, but uh, my son edited it for me, and I will make that available to you. And Joe is such a cool guy that we didn't finish the session he did another webinar two weeks later and recorded it for us. So I have that plus the handout 
plus all of his resources. And it's um, how to do a Captivate lesson that can go directly to cell phone. So um, it's creating the best e-learning using Adobe Captivate. I loved it. I sat, uh, sat in a session with Beth. And um, so I just wanted to share the BYOL is part of it. Bring your own laptop. So it's not just going in and listening to someone talk. There are sessions where you're actually learning something and using it at the time and you can take it home with you. So it's great. Plus you get a lot of swag. <laughs> okay, I'm done. Who's, who's on next? We'll do Q&A at the end, I think. Let's do that. Okay, Stuart, I'm gonna give you control of the screen. You're on. Okay, just unmuting myself. Can everybody hear me? Great. I can. Okay, great. <clears throat> so, um, good morning. So, uh, as I was in this webinar, my power went out. And so that, so I switched over to my iPhone. My iPhone is, uh, what is it when they, it's sharing my internet connection. And so that's how I'm connecting with you right now. So kind of interesting. If you need me to step through for you, I will. Okay. Thank you very much. Actually, I think I may need you to step through. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah. Could you go to the next slide, please? Sure. Thank you. Okay. So... Um, okay, so my name is Stuart Brown, and uh, just a in quick introduction, I'm a, a class of 2012, um, and um, I graduated, uh, as soon as, before I graduated, I, I got a job, job offer to work at UCLA Health, and I work as a principal trainer of digital content for UCLA Health, and mainly work on the um, electronic health record that they've implemented there, but as well as the um, IS um, department, information systems department, um, doing uh, e-learning and um, website, uh, anything that has to do with digital content, um, I work with, but my main forte is e-learning and training resource management. <clears throat> so um, so uh, when I graduated, um, I was, I've been working at UCLA Health and it's been like a very, challenging position, a lot of work, and I haven't had really a chance to really, um, you know, find out what's going on in the uh, instructional design e-learning industry. <clears throat> so this year I had the opportunity to go, um, and they, my, um, my manager sent me, and it was, it was great. Um, I have to say that, um, I don't know, was there a slide before this? Um, Let's see if I can. No. Nope. Okay. So there wasn't. Okay. So, anyways, there was a slide before. If we can go back to the previous one, thank you. So, anyways, big picture was the slide that I thought was going to show, but but um, being away from school for about three years and then working, um, it, going to Devlin really helped me to uh, see what is going on, and I was absolutely um, just amazed at how much our industry is growing. Um, I was like, my eyes were opened. It was so awesome to be able to see that other like-minded people um, who do what I do and being able to just um, hang out with them, especially our alumni um, and our teachers. Um, it was just awesome. It was so great to, to be together and to just see what is happening. So, um, so I think this is a great DevLearn and other types of conferences like this. I would definitely encourage our, um, our, our um, alumni and so on to go because it's, it's, I think it's worth it. So one of the sessions that I attended was um, Agile Project Management. And this um, particular one was interesting to me because we talk a lot about Addy in um, instructional design. Uh, assess, design, develop, implement, and evaluate. And I think um, uh, Agile is a more um, iterative approach. Um, you can see the loops there. Um, and um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a review process at each phase. And um, when I do a lot of, um, when I work on projects, 
Um, I don't necessarily think about Addy or Agile, but I think that the review process is key. So starting with the end in mind, um, our customers, um, and then when we start a project, you know, have certain points where the review is happening. I think Agile really um, promotes that. And I think for any project that I'm working on, um, I like to have that feedback at certain phases so that I know that it's meeting the expectations um, of, of the customer. So Agile project management um, is more iterative and you can see the, the, the process there. Um, and a little bit more flexible um, than Addy. So I felt that was, it was good. It was kind of a broader concept um, and software developers tend to use it more, but um, it also is being used in instructional design. So I found that interesting. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so um, in the, what I do, I develop a lot of e-learning um, and I don't always have a, the opportunity to be creative. And so I feel that sometimes like, oh, I'm not creative, you know, I, so I should go to a creative class, you know, and see what they have to say about the creative um, process. And I really enjoyed the instructor. The instructor really, um, really hit home that we are all creative that we um, that we need to give ourselves um, license to be creative, um, and that um, creativity is like um, she you know gave a quote from uh, Steve Jobs about how creativity is just putting things together. And as a, as in instructional designers, that's what we're doing. We're putting things together. So whether we're using theory or uh, software or project management or collaboration. We're, we're using all these things to create something. And so it kind of made me feel good. <laughs> um, and then she gave examples about um, uh, uh, like the mouse party and um, how there's an underlying story and that how it uses breadcrumbs and allows you to find it. So as you're doing the e-learning, you're kind of exploring and finding, and she just thought she, um, you know, this particular example was so good um, to, um, you know, as a creative example, this mouse party e-learning. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Oculus um, was uh, the, one of the Oculus technical uh, founders was there and he gave a keynote and I was like fascinated as well. I thought that this project VR in general is um, interesting and he, um, he gave like a good, um, just uh, uh, what, it, what it takes to be part of the team at Oculus. And um, it was really interesting to me that um, he found that they didn't need just technical experts. They needed um, employees who could work well with teams that could um, that have all around skill sets, um, and I personally think that this is so important um, with my job where I'm at. Um, like I know I, I I know what I'm good at in terms of you know what I you know certain areas of my job that I'm I know I'm really good at, but um, the being able to collaborate with employees and work together so that we can move forward is almost as important as whether I'm a technical, whether I'm good at a certain aspect. So um, I just feel like the, um, with projects, um, you know, working well together is so important and I, this, the founder really stressed that. Um, so that was something I found interesting as well. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so new software um, that was out was really interesting as well. Um, so Storyline, um, they did Demo Fest and um, Storyline was really popular. I was actually, I mean, I was kind of shocked because um, I'm a big Captivate user. Um, but um, Storyline, I just seemed very polished, very nice. Um, I personally would like to use it more. I just, um, I just uh, have to find ways to to, um, to be able to implement it into our workflows um, because we're so embedded with Captivate right now. Um, HTML5 is uh, really, that's another one that's huge right now um, because Flash is being um, you know, phased out. Everything I know on my job, like everything we're gonna be producing HTML5. 
um, because of Flash going away. And then, um, and HTML5 is great because it now it works with an iPhone or, you know, it, um, it works with most of the devices, whereas in Flash doesn't. So um, eLearning Brothers, um, they are a, a company that creates templates, eLearning templates, and it was, um, they're really big. I was so kind of impressed by their, um, their whole booth, and um, I haven't had a chance to use them, but I would like to be able to, um, you know, I produce so much e-learning that I don't have time to build everything by scratch. So if I can take a template and customize it and brand it, then it really, um, I think they're kind of, I would like to look into their templates. So next slide, please. So video and interactivity was another one I went to. Um, this one, um, it was interesting in that um, they showed how um, video is really being used. And I'm a big video. I, I think video is so huge. Um, I, it's almost underestimated how much we use video. Like sites like you know, YouTube and Vimeo, we know how popular those are. But the ability to embed video into Captivate or into your projects and then use the other features of Captivate like interactivity to kind of do a simulation after they watch a video. Um, those kinds of things make e-learning much more interesting. So I feel like um, while I, you know, this is kind of a proprietary type of demonstration, you know, I'd have to use their product. Um, I have to tell you on the job, um, I do use like, I do, I use Vimeo uh, embed code into my Captivate projects um, so that I do have, the, I'm able to produce HTML5 e-learning with embedded video and then use other Captivate, um, you know, interactions to kind of, you know, um, you know, mix things up. And so I felt like that that's really big and I, I really, I'm really interested in that. Next slide, please. Okay, so, <laughs> so here's my rock on picture. Um, so eLearning Brothers had a KISS impersonator. He is an Army veteran, and I had to take a picture with him. Um, I wanted to just uh, it, to say thank you for letting me present uh, and encourage all of our um, students to just finish, finish, your, finish your degree. It's going to help you and rock on. So that's it for thank me. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Or we'll, we'll do that at the end. Okay, Lindsay, you're on. I'm going to give you remote control. Okay. Uh, where are you? Okay. Okay. Let's see. Okay. So I'm going to talk about, let me see if I am able to control this. I made my screen smaller. Ah, there it is. Oh, those arrows get tiny. Come on, go. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about, let me go back. Um, just two sessions in particular that I went to that really stuck with me, one about animations and one about beacons. So I'm gonna talk about animation pretty briefly because the entire webinar is actually archived on YouTube. It isn't just a recording from the conference. This presenter, Tim Slade, has an incredible web presence and he's recorded a lot of his presentations including the slide decks and everything and put them onto YouTube. So you can see the exact same presentation that I watched on YouTube, and I really recommend watching it. It was really good. And this slide deck is in there also. But here's a couple of takeaways from that. Uh-oh, that's not moving. Or my little arrow just disappeared. Huh. There we go. Yes? I know it goes away. It gets. Oh, weird. how strange. Maybe it's, it's going to lag. It goes invisible for some reason. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, now it's working. All right. So the main point from Tim Slate's presentation is that animation is a form of nonverbal communication. There's a lot of novelty animations that are included with PowerPoint and with Captivate and a lot of the time, they're not doing your presentation any good. They're just distractions from whatever your, your content, whatever your point is you're trying to make. So he classified animations into three different categories. The first was 
directional animations. And he's got examples of all of these in his presentation as well. The directional animations are animations that direct the learner's attention to do something rather than actually using your words to tell them to do something. For example, in a lot of e-learning tutorials, a next button appears and a voiceover or a little screen will appear saying, click next to continue. But instead of doing that, you could just put an arrow or something in the corner and have it just subtly move back and forth so your learner is going to spot it. It's a direction for the learner and it's nonverbal communication and it's not treating them like they need to be told to push next to continue while still helping them if for some reason they didn't notice that button. Next one's transitional animations. So this isn't just transitioning necessarily between sections, but it's to introduce or highlight new content or he also uses this kind of animation to give a sense of physical space. For example, if um, a lot of our e-learning has a main menu and you want the learner to go through in a certain way or something will only unlock once they've achieved the entire section's goals, um, you can actually introduce that new menu item or show that it's unlocked using an animation rather than just having the learner having to figure out themselves what's unlocked or not. Um, and also if you use transitional animations, he, got some, he has some good examples again you can um, give a really good sense of entering a new section of a tutorial. So if a learner completed a section, it's gonna be really clear that they're starting on a new topic and that's important for learning also. And lastly, his last topic or his last category was instructional animations. Um, again, it's a form of nonverbal communication and rather than explaining a topic, again, with your words, you could use animations to show how something works. So you already use this, for example, if you're teaching children how to do gardening, you could show the watering can pouring the water in and how, how that kind of process works. Um, again, he's got some great examples in his YouTube webinar. It's only 36 minutes. I really recommend that you watch it. Uh, it he has some really great examples that will really inspire you to use animations in a different way. And his last really big takeaway was, oops, I went too fast. When in doubt, Fade in and out. Again, there's a lot of novelty animations. If you're using them because they're cute, they're not adding to your, your e-learning content, they're probably taking away because they're just kind of distractions. All right, so I've got a little bit more in this section. I'm really interested in, in eye beacons and the possibilities of using eye beacons. Um, Barbara mentioned in her first introductory section that there is a, a woman at DemoFest from a museum that had kids wear lanyards with a beacon in them so that their teacher got a report at the end of the day of all the exhibits the students visited. And that, that woman is using eye beacons in her um, lanyards along with the X API to get everything to talk to each other. So I went to this guy's presentation. It was great. His slides are online. He's also got a, um, an app that he developed for his project that he's, he's released free online. That's in his presentation as well. Um, so beacons. Let me do show both of them. Okay, so a beacon is just a device that uses like just a Bluetooth wireless signal to deliver location-based information. So it's just kind of like one of these things is sitting in the corner of a room and all it's doing is this broadcasting, I'm here, here's my serial number, that's it. So what you have to do is you build an app or some other piece of software that is always looking for the beacon that's closest to and the app will do something different depending on what beacon it's near. So in the case of that woman at the museum, each um, student had a lanyard with a beacon and every time they went, got close to an exhibit, it's location-based information, the exhibit recorded that they visited that. So at the end of the day, they're able to generate a report because the student's beacon was talking to the exhibit. So they're looking for each other's signals. Um, so it does take an app on a Bluetooth enabled device to recognize the beacons around it and to actually do something with that information. So an, a commercial example of this would be if you um, downloaded uh, an app for a shoe store, for example, and you have your phone when you're walking into the shoe store, if they had a beacon in the shoe store and the app was programmed to recognize that beacon, your phone might buzz you and say, hey, welcome to store 3387. Here's a coupon for a pair of shoes. So there's some interesting applications with that. Um, the two beacons I have on the screen on the left, these are called Estimote beacons. Um, it, this is just a, it's a simple technology. There's a lot of different companies that, that make these. The one on the left though does come with a software development kit. It's $59 for three of these. You can just paste them up in, in individual rooms. They do take power to run. These help tiny little batteries in them, but it does come with a software for you to make those go. 
Um, and on the other side, I've got uh, waterproof beacons from, is it called Alibaba? Did I get that right? Um, you can get them for a dollar to eight dollars per piece for beacons. They just take forever because I think they ship from China. But you can get this technology pretty cheap. Uh, the ones on the right, though, don't come with any supporting software. You have to write everything yourself. So that's just something to consider. Um, so, oh, this is the example I already said. Um, what did Valerie say? I think, I think Verizon does this when I walk by the store. Yeah, when you, when you buy your phone, it has all that, those apps you can't uninstall. I'm sure that Verizon is tracking when you're walking by their store and trying to get you to walk into their store. Um, it's kind of a funny thing. Um, so yeah, here's an example, just a visual example I found online of someone using an Estimote beacon in a shoe store so that when you walk into the store, it buzzes you and it says, welcome, Anna, I know who you are. It's, it's kind of creepy, but <laughs> yeah. at least it's, it's an acknowledgement that we're being tracked when we're walking around with our phones. So let's see if I can go on to the next slide. Okay. Um, so here's a nice picture I found from a museum that uses beacons in their exhibits for iPad tours. So I'm sure everyone's been to a museum that offers the iPads or an iPhone or an app you can download to walk around and view all the exhibits and get more information. So this one, they have minimal printed information hanging near their exhibits, but as you walk up with your iPad, your iPhone with Bluetooth on, the app recognizes which exhibit you're near and will start playing a narration or give you more information to explore when you're near the exhibit. So that's how that technology works, is that they're actually using beacons in each exhibit and they all are powered with the little tiny battery and they're broadcasting their location so your app that you're using knows exactly where you are and can give you information about where you are so there's a couple different uses here there's um the ability to give you information about where you are location-based information there's also the ability to track where you've been if that's a use that you wanted for that so let's see if that goes on the next slide okay for me come on let's do this Okay, so as far as the actual software behind this, there's two different platforms for writing your app to use beacons. iBeacon, of course, is Apple's beacon platform. The one on the right is called Eddystone. That's Google's beacon platform. So basically, you have to pick one or the other when you're writing your app. Again, this is another challenge with trying to write an app for multiple platforms is that you'd have to write a separate app for each one using the specific code for each one. But a lot of that, if you have a, a nice programmer friend and want to learn that, um, there are a lot of starter kits you could probably get online. And um, the presenter, let's see if I have a slide for this. I can't remember. This takes a moment to change. Come on, you can do it. Um, let's see. So the takeaway here is that location must augment learning. Barbara, you have a phone ringing? No. Oh, okay. Um, maybe stop that. Um, just like with animations, don't use beacons just to use beacons, especially because they cost money and take a lot of programming know-how. Um, the man that did the presentation actually built a scavenger hunt app for new employees. So they're handed an iPad with the app on it. And um, as part of their orientation, they actually had to walk around the building and for each place that they visited in the building, the app would unlock questions about that specific place. So if they went to the break room, the break room section would unlock and they could actually answer questions about what was going on in the break room. So again, just like with animations, location must matter and actually augment your learning. And that is all I have. Thank you. Okay, who's on next? I believe it's me. Oh. On. I'm going to give you remote control. You okay. Now? Okay, they're on. Click to start the mouse keyboard of the shift. Oh, okay. Can we see your face? Are you on? You know, you know what? I have an old uh, monitor. Sorry about that. I should have. That's okay. I was just going to highlight you, but all right. <laughs> That's okay. Um, let me expand this. Okay, and today I am going to be talking about uh, responsive output using Captivate. And um, there's a few things to know. You have different breakpoints and what you do, you start using your desktop and that trickles down into the different breakpoints being tablet and your mobile uh, view. 
And I'm going to give you some tips on resizing assets for the different breakpoints. And what I'm really looking for, oh, is that the? I'm sorry, where's the, uh, how do I go forward? Oh, and it disappears on this screen for some reason. It's the arrow. Oh, there it is. It's weird. I, it's weird. Yeah. Oh, okay. It bites out as soon as you go away from it. Oh, so I should leave my uh, cursor directly yeah. over? Okay, okay. Sorry about that, folks. Um, so when you open Captivate, you, it's an added um, layout. You, sit, you simply cl um, click on Responsive Project. And then you have a default of three breakpoints. And these are at the very top of your, um, your stage. And so you see you have your primary, which is your desktop or laptop, and you have your tablet and you have your mobile. You also have the option of doing custom tablet or custom mobile. You see the little arrow um, where the number 1024 is, for example. So if you take that little arrow and slide it over, you can actually customize the size of what you're creating. And I lost my arrow again. <laughs> oh, oh, it does, it works anyway. Oh, that's what you were saying, huh, Lindsay? Um, so, the, well, one of the ways, the best way I think to work is from desktop down. So basically, this is a uh, e-learning I did for Carrington, and this is the desktop view. And so when you create something on the desktop, it's building it on the tablet, and it's building it on the mobile. And pretty much you get a pretty good view on the um, tablet, but when you start breaking it down to the mobile size, things start happening. And this is your tablet view. As you can see, it was pretty good. Um, I didn't really have to adjust anything. And then here is your, um, your mobile view. And as you can see, the words, the font, and the, um, I mean, all of the content starts getting all smooshed up, and your character gets really small, and it just doesn't really look good. So what I did is I resized the titles, and I resized and re repositioned the asset, and uh, this is what we came up with, and it looks much better that way. And what I learned in this is I had, um, I use a lot of animated text, and what I discovered when I opened this is it kind of disappeared. And I thought, well, what's going on? I just wanted to change the size, and I couldn't change the size. So what I discovered is that uh, there's no support for SWF animations, which is what Adobe uses in Captivate for all of their text animation. And it's not supported in any mobile browser. So that's something to really be aware of. Um, and if you want to use that, you're going to have to actually import a web object and create your animations in JavaScript or something. Um, and, oh, okay. Basically, you do all of this through your properties and your position panels, which you can see through your window file. And I intentionally left mine short because I wasn't sure how much time we were going to have, Barb, uh -huh. because I, I'm the one who put together the entire presentation for everybody. I kind of gathered all the, the slides and put them together, and it looked kind of long to me. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, so I didn't want to, I, I wasn't sure how much time we'd have, and I wanted to leave a little time for Q&A. But anyway, here are a couple really good links, and I did create an MSIDT folder in Dropbox where this presentation lives, and we will also put other files and upload other documents for you guys, too. But uh, eLearning Joe, this is Joe Ganchi that um, Barb referred to earlier. He's an Adobe expert and he does great stuff. In fact, this coming weekend, there's going to be a, um, a training magazine. Um, they're doing a conference and I'm going to a certificate program and Joe is actually putting on a Captivate certificate program. If anybody's interested, if your company will pay for it, that's even better, but he will be down there. And he's great. And then um, Dr. Pooja Jasing is another Adobe expert. And she's got a site with a lot of um, tips and tricks on when using Captivate. And with that, I will open it up to Q&A. OK. Everybody can ask anybody questions. Go for it. 
Hi, this is Fawn. And I have a question about Storyline. Uh, and if we're going to have an opportunity to use it in the program, or is it something that um, we should explore on our own? I've, I've heard uh, from other people, too, being other students in the program being curious about Storyline and what it's all about. Cynthia still on? <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Um, so we only require that you um, have access to Captivate in the program because we're not really a um, how-to program. You know, it's more theoretically based. So if you know how to use Captivate, those skills are transferable to other programs like Storyline. Okay. Um, so, but I do suggest that you go to lynda.com and you have access to lynda.com through the portal. And that's where you can check out Storyline. And um, I, I think that once you open it up and, and take a look at Storyline, you'll see how similar it is to lynda.com or to Captivate. And you'll see that like you could pick it up in a day probably. Uh, can oh, I chime in on that? I'm sorry. Uh, can I chime? This is Beth. May I chime in on that for a little bit? Sure. Sure. Okay. So the one thing about Storyline, and it is, it is very user friendly, and I think that's why people like it. And and it reminded me of PowerPoint when I went into it. But the thing about that is, if you want to do responsive, you can't really use Storyline that I know of. Articulate 360 is out now, and they do have responsive technology built into that. It's called RISC. I haven't had time to use it, but it's a whole other package that, is, from what I can tell, you're going to have to buy. So I think, it's a, I think store, uh, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I think yeah. it comes with a $2,000 price tag. Is that right? Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. It's really high. And one thing I like about Adobe, they update their products. Captivate 8 included responsive technology, and it just got better in 9. So I'm not trying to say, way rah, rah, uh, Captivate or Adobe, but I do, I do prefer it when a company upgrades a product and allows you to buy an upgraded version as opposed to a whole new package. I just think it's more fair. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh-huh. I also wanted to mention something about <clears throat> responsive de design because um, I'm just getting into HTML5 right now. And really the main reason why I'm, I'm, I'm getting into HTML5 is because Flash is going away. And so when I produce an e-learning project out of Captivating H an HTML5, um, it'll open in any browser, including your phone or your iPad. So, um, so that in itself is good, and there is a um, there is a so I don't have to create a responsive project. I can just produce an HTML five project, uh -huh. and I can set it to um, to auto auto size. So while you know, of course, I understand a, a phone is smaller than a desktop, you know, and a you know tablets in between. I think um, it's nice to be able to actually have a project, an e-learning project play in any browser, including an iPhone or an iPad. And so you can think about your sizing options from there, you know, like Beth is saying, if you want to start moving into H, uh, responsive, but HTML5 is the key. That's the key to get it to play in, in, in any browser. That's, that's correct. I can jump on that bandwagon too. Yeah. Flash is, I, I believe is, is dying out. And um, that's why I was saying you can't really use any of the animated um, assets in Captivate if you're going to design for mobile. It's just not supported in the browsers. So I too, we too design with HTML5 and we, um, we publish to that. Um, if I may ask another question about publishing since we're on that um, topic. I know with IDT 505, um, I kind of struggle a bit with, with how to publish our final project. I try Amazon S3, I try Dropbox, and then I end up uploading it on my Weebly website. Um, but that was a Flash version. What do you recommend? Like, what do you think is the best way to publish in a Captivate 9 project? I think like um, like Stuart was saying, HTML5 is the best way to go. And in Captivate, you can check 
I, you can check both. You can check Flash or Captivate when publishing. So you can you might be able to have the best of both worlds. Some people will be able to see it if, in fact, they have Flash Player installed and they're on a desktop or a laptop. And uh, for the rest of the folks, HTML5 will work anywhere. Mm -hmm. So um, the other thing, too, just to piggyback off Beth, um, is that after you publish your files, you if you want to get them on the web and create a link, you need to have access to a web server. So when you are at work and you have access to that, like an LMS or a web server, then, um, then you can get your link out of there. But if you're not at work and you're trying to do this as a student, and um, I personally have not done that, but I think other people have tried. I don't know if you've Googled it or not, but I think people, um, I, I just, I don't, I don't have a good answer for you there. I think people have tried putting it on um, Dropbox or Google Drive, Yeah. Um, you know, and, but I just don't know the step-by-step -step for there. I, I've done just a teeny bit of research on that. Dropbox and Google Drive, they used to offer support where you could run e-learning content from those places, wow. but I know Google Drive took it off. I think Dropbox wow. took it off also. Wow. I, pay, I pay for web hosting. I pay about 80 to 100 bucks a year for my own domain and my own online web space. So that's where I build my portfolio and any content I put on there, it runs. Lin Lindsay, do you know if Wix or any of the other um, freebies like Weebly or... No, the, the, free stuff, the free stuff, you can embed stuff into it, but it doesn't uh -huh. have web hosting. It's just okay. like producing a pretty document for you. Shelly Gilmore put in the chat here, Amazon S or 3S is really good. They have um, free web hosting, so it's just online hosting, and you just link to it, so that's a good option as well. There's not really a lot that's free, though. If you want it to be stable and last forever, I would just get web hosting, though it does cost a little bit each year. Okay. Right. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think um, the whole LMS, you know, when you when you publish a project and you want that web link and then you want to be able to begin tracking and stuff, like there's tracking within Captivate that you can get like an email notification and so on. But um, like when you start moving into like tracking with a learning management system, there's not a whole lot out there. You know, your work is going to provide that or yeah, you just, I, mean, I haven't done research on for a very small scale you know, individual type of use as well. But it'd be nice to know. I personally would want to know for a portfolio or, or just if I was doing a project on the side. Thank you, that answered all of my questions. I have a question for Stuart, there's many. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, you mentioned um, using videos kind of with interactive elements kind of going back and forth. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how long do you usually, how long are your videos? Okay. Yeah, so great question. Um, so I think it's always better to have short videos. You know, there's this term um, called micro e-learning. Um, but I think shorter is better. Uh, always, you know, it's all, I think the only way you're going to do that is probably to script out your, your e-learning. So if you have two columns, one is what they're, what you're, what, what you're, um, what you're going to write, what you're going to say, and on the left-hand column, what they're going to see. And um, then when you're doing your um, e-learning or your demo e-learning, you can, you can use a script and kind of, you can make sure that you're, you know, what you need to say is going to get said within a, your script and the shorter is better. Um, so, yeah, so I think video is great. Camtasia is a great tool for video. Um, love Camtasia. It's so good for creating um, demo e-learning, like Khan Academy, Sal, Sal from Khan Academy, the founder, I think he uses Camtasia. Yeah. So many people use it. It's such a great, easy tool to use. Easy to um, how to edit. It's great. I love it's it. Wonderful, yes. And then the other thing is that, um, so... I don't use a lot of like interactions within video because um, I use Captivate. And Lindsay and I had a conversation about this at the, at the DevLearn because she knows how to do this. She knows how to use Camtasia that has like hotspots in there and then add all your produced elements onto a web server and do that. But I use, I use Captivate as my main e-learning tool. I produce e uh, demo e-learning in Camtasia and then I embed that into Captivate. So I can't, I can't use those um, interactions within Captivate. So then in Captivate, all you do are like a software simulation 
and I'll, I'll, um, uh, and I'll, I'll create a, a simulation in there, and there I can add all my interactions using a Captivate project. Cool. And I, I pasted in the, in the chat, I went to a really awesome session at DevLearn on micro video where he actually really broke it down. I always recommend three to five minutes for a video. And his presentation was great because he also got into the, the basic emotions of um, pushing and pulling people into video. So he has this nice little breakdown of how to structure your video and how long each segment should be, how to present the content, how to reinforce the content, how to tie it up. It was, it was really nice and neat. He had some examples in there. And one more note about Camtasia. If you do produce interactive videos to Camtasia, you have to have web hosting again, or you have to put it someplace special that's, that allows interactivity with Camtasia because like Captivate, it produces a, um, a whole web package. So just a side note for that. We are having a wonderful discussion, and we've run up against our time limit, 12 o'clock. So um, I'm willing to leave it open, but I know that there are some people who need to run. And Cynthia has an announcement before we close. Cynthia, you're on. Oh, thank you so much. First, I want to say thank you to everyone for presenting, and thank you to the 21 people who showed up today. That's awesome. Um, we are having, uh, well, uh, let me backtrack a second. Um, I shared with the College of Ed Dean that we have been hosting webinars and how successful they are. And so she asked me to create a webinar series for the entire College of Ed, and I did. So we have nine webinars coming up um, through the college. Um, so I posted the link right now in the chat window. So if you take a look at that, you can see there's a whole range of webinars, everything from uh, what's involved in applying to a doctoral program to what's, what's happening in Japan with cyberbullying. Um, if you wanna teach in higher education, you have some questions about that. You, there's a webinar for that as well. And Lindsay's, uh, Lindsay has a webinar um, coming up too. Um, I think it's 20 different, um, websites and apps that deal with education technology. So um, even though they're not specifically designed for um, instructional designers, I think that you will probably find one or two that will interest you. So please join us if you would like to. They're all on Monday evenings starting at 7 p 6 p.m.? 6 p.m. Starting at 6 p.m. throughout the entire semester. And they're free and open, so you can invite your friends too. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. I'm going to... Cynthia, I do have one last question, if I may. Are you going to be recording those sessions by chance? Yes, they'll all be recorded and posted. Yay! Okay, perfect. Thanks a lot. Okay, we're going to stop the recording now. This is going to be posted in our Dropbox, and we'll send it out to all of you. Um, plus, I noticed that Lindsay linked the uh, presentations from DevLearn, the slide decks. So I'm going to add those to mine as well. It'll make it pretty big, but um, then you'll have access to those. And you can see it's a pretty, even though it is, I noticed in the chat discussion about the cost. If you work in higher ed, there's a discount. If you're a student, there's a discount. If you work for the government, there's a discount. So it's really worth going if you can talk to your employer about sending you. It, you come back with so much. So it, I think it's worth it. So. Have a great weekend, guys. Thank you for coming. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.